Hello everyone, let us start with the first chapter of biology class 11. That is the living world. Now this is the basic chapter and it is very simple and easy. But it is very important as well. This chapter will develop your basics and help you in the further syllabus. Now if we see from a neat point of view, there are only two to three questions maximum that are asked from this chapter. And whenever we hear about this topic living world, the first question that pops in our mind is, is, is always what is living? Now, how will you assign living or non-living to a thing? Let's say we talk about a table. Now, how will you say that this table is living or non-living? Now, even if I ask a third class student, that, you know, that student will say, if I ask him that if the table is living or non-living, he or she will clearly reply that a table is non-living. And if I ask someone that if a rabbit is living or non-living, they will say that a rabbit is living. But the question is, how do we define living or non-living? And the answer to this question lies in our ability to differentiate a particular characteristic from another. In case of living, we always compare it with its opposite, that is the inanimate entity. Now this is just a fancy term for non-living. Okay, so this is just a fancy term for non-living. So what is living? Living is something that is alive, something that can grow, move, reproduce, respire and carry out various cellular activities. To define a thing living, we follow some parameters which we will discuss in detail today. The parameters can be defined into two main features. So one is the defining characteristic and the another one is the fundamental for characteristic okay so there are four parameters of living that we will discuss right now the first one is growth so growth is basically nothing but increase in size volume and surface area it these are the factors like increment in weight or length all of these are growth now in NCRT, it is clearly mentioned that there are the twin components of growth. The first one is increase in numbers. And the second one is increase in mass. So well, how the, there, are, how, there are two components of growth, which are the increase in numbers and the increase in mass. And there are two types of growth also. So the first one is intrinsic and the second one is extrinsic. So the growth that occurs internally, so internal growth is called intrinsic growth and the external growth is called extrinsic growth. Let us understand this with an example. So when your height increases, it is intrinsic growth. But if you wear heels and increase your height, it is extrinsic growth. Because when you will remove the heels, your height will go back to normal. And there are some examples of extrinsic growth also. So in, the, in terms of extrinsic growth, like the deposition of snow on mountains or sand on the sand dunes, all of these are extrinsic growth. Now we need to understand that when we say intrinsic growth, it is only and only found in living things. So intrinsic will always be found only in the living things. It is the defining feature of living. But when we talk about only growth, then and when, when you know when, when we talk about only growth and no type is specified, that is the fundamental feature. So once again, let us understand. So intrinsic is the defining feature. Well, normally when we say growth, when no type is specified, that is the fundamental feature of living things. The next parameter that we have is reproduction. So, so we all are studying this topic from 8th and 9th standards and we all have a fairly good idea about what is reproduction. But let's recall it really quickly. We will study this topic in complete detail in the next chapters. But for now, let's understand. So reproduction is of two types asexual and sexual. Let's talk about the general features of asexual reproduction first. So in terms of asexual reproduction, what is this basically? So it's a simple process. It's a simple process. It is easy. There is no genetic 
variation and because there are no genetic variations clones are formed but when we talk about sexual reproduction so basically that this process is elaborate okay so this is elaborate again it's complex it's slow and you know basically in this genetic variability does take place so you see we need to understand that asexual and sexual reproduction as we see that you know they are like opposites of each other so it's simple it's elaborate it's easy it's complex there is no genetic variation in asexual there is genetic variation in sexual there are no clones formed in sexual and there are clones formed in asexual so we can see these are the like complete opposites of each other but how does you know genetic variability happen in sexual reproduction see because in sexual reproduction gamete formation takes place the next event is gamete fusion that is syngamy and the last stage is zygote formation and you do all these steps there is genetic variability in sexual reproduction now let us study the types of asexual reproduction the first we have is binary fusion so this is like a really simple process a cell so a cell divides into two individuals very easy an example is amoeba as we know so an amoeba which we can draw like this so an amoeba just divides into two and that is how reproduction in amoeba takes place so we talk about budding example hydra and yeast so now the structure of in budding so structure of hydra is somewhere like this and what will happen that a part so the bud will just fall off and it will again develop into a different structure altogether of an hydra so that is how you know in hydra and yeast reproduction place takes place through budding so this bud will detach and form a new individual and the next is fragmentation so in fragmentation for example a spirogyra a long individual a long individual will break down into two parts and these both will individually live their life then and the last one is regeneration so see many students are confused with regeneration and fragmentation there is a difference between both methods in regeneration the organisms break into two parts and each part develops into a new individual so basically in regeneration the organism break into parts and each parts will develop into new new individual but in fragmentation the new fragment so the new fragment will live as it is and does not form a whole body therefore it can be concluded that regeneration this is a more complex process than fragmentation okay so now now our main question is you know why now my, our main question is reproduction is a fundamental feature or a defining feature now do all organisms first of all the question is do all organisms that are living reproduce so obviously there are some exceptions to this like the worker bees so these are living creatures but they do not reproduce likewise mules which is a mixture of donkey plus horse now these are in fertile and because they are in fertile they do not reproduce in fact there are humans who cannot reproduce because they are infertile so do we consider them as non living obviously no and there are some exceptions of reproduction and hence reproduction is not a defining feature it is not a defining feature it is a fundamental feature so to be considered living you do not need to reproduce okay great so most of the living beings do reproduce but there are exceptions as we just saw now let's look at growth and reproduction in unicellular organisms the organisms so you know these are the unicellular organisms so these are the organisms with single cell so here the growth and reproduction both of these are mutually inclusive events in unicellular 
which means that they are both the same thing in unicellular always growth is equals to reproduction okay so in unicellular growth is always equal to reproduction and how as we see you know that there is an amoeba okay so it's like it's a very bad looking amoeba as of now but no worries so an amoeba you know it divides itself into two as we can see here these are two so this is also its growth and this is also its reproduction but in multicellular organisms in multicellular organisms reproduction and growth are both mutually exclusive events these are both mutually exclusive events which means that both of these are different things so in multicellular organisms growth and reproduction are different things okay so okay so this is really important and this is uh, this is actually been asked in exam so if what happens you know this is been asked in exams in multicellular to be considered growth and reproduction is mutually exclusive or inclusive events so the answer to that question is mutually exclusive events so the next factor we have here is metabolism now it is found only and only in living things and that is why it is what a uh, defining it is a defining feature okay so it is of two types basically catabolism and anabolism so anabolism is the synthesis of macromolecules so this is the synthesis while catabolism is the breakdown of macromolecules okay so whenever a product is formed it is called anabolism an example for this is photosynthesis and whenever and whenever a product is broken down into smaller ones that's called catabolism for example respiration for example respiration okay so metabolism is catabolism plus anabolism so if you see in a cell the process of both breaking down and synthesis are occurring simultaneously okay so in any cell the process of breakdown and synthesis are actually occurring simultaneously so if we take out a process okay let's say we talk about you know let's say photosynthesis so let's if we take out the process and do it in a test tube in a lab you know so if we do photosynthesis and we provide everything you know the ph the light etc everything so does that mean that a test tube is living no of course not now photosynthesis photosynthesis now this is a living reaction but it does not make the test tube living so test tube is still non living okay because it is only one process now just uh, you know the test tube cannot go under undergo every process of living beings in one tube of course no it will not be considered as living therefore metabolism is defining feature of the living now if you want to see all the reactions of metabolism it is present only in cells metabolism equals life now cellular organization now this is to see the proper metabolical interactions we need to see the cellular organization now that is the defining property of the living the next feature we have is consciousness now consciousness is also the defining feature of living what is consciousness basically so it is response to a stimulus now we cannot point out consciousness okay it is the most obvious yet technically complicated feature of living beings any organism which is a, which is alive will respond to the exam and you know for your environment for example your pet dog so whenever your pet dog is feeling hot he will come into an ac room and whenever they feel cold they will on their own go to the sunlight now this is the response to the external stimuli 
Even the smallest living organisms respond to stimulus. Now the question arises, so if a man is in coma, okay, so if the patient is in coma, is he conscious? Or if we say that if, so now we can, if the question is that, you know, if a patient is in coma, is that patient, you know, living or dead? Now to be frank, we cannot answer this question clearly. Neither we can answer this question properly ethically. And we will decide if the person is living or non-living by the end situation. If the man comes out of the coma, he is living. If he will, but if he never comes out of the, out of the coma, he will be dead. While he is in coma, we can't clearly justify his, his existence. It's like the Schrodinger's cat, you know, it's living and non-living at the same time. Okay, so it's living and dead at the same time. So the next question we have here is, you ask, you tell me, are all living beings self-conscious? Okay. And I will tell you the answer to this. It's not, they are not self-conscious. It's not true. Because all living organisms are conscious. They are not all self-conscious. So self is the key word here that we need to understand. So if the question was, are all living beings conscious? So your, so your answer would be yes, they are all conscious. But are all living beings self-conscious? So here the answer would be no. And it is important to understand this difference. Let's understand it this way. So if you know what you are eating, where you are going, where you are sitting, this is self-conscious. We are aware of our surroundings, but your dog doesn't care about how he is looking or where he is walking. Hence, only humans are self-conscious. Therefore, self-conscious is the defining feature of humans, of humans. So self-consciousness is a defining feature of humans, but consciousness is a defining feature of all living beings. Now let's have a look at the important lines from NCRT. The first we have here is, all living phenomena are due to underlying interactions. Let's understand this line, you know, let's understand this statement basically with the help of this diagram. So when you look at it, so when we look at cell, so the function of cell in itself is not done completely by the internal organality, organalities it processes. Okay, so does this mean that the parts of cell, the insider parts of cells do not actually perform the function of cell, but the interaction of these all internal parts of cell make the function of cell itself. So that, so this means once again, when we talk about a tissue, which is actually a cluster of cell. So the entire function of tissue is not done by each cell present in it. But the function of tissue is made from the interaction of all the cells performing their functions. Then we move on to organs. So the entire function of organs is not done by individual tissue. But the complex interaction between different tissues form the entire function of an organ. In the same we move to the organ system and then to the entire organisms. So that is what we mean that all living phenomena are due to the underlying interactions. The second is all living beings because all living beings are self-replicating, interactive and evolving systems. It's a fairly clear line. I don't think we need to, you know, dwell upon it a lot. The last one is that we share common genetic material, but to varying degree. Okay. Let's understand this. So we, all of us, okay. So all of us have some form of shared genetic material. That is why we all have some similar qualities in the core of us that, you know, that are, that we actually relate with, but this is to a varying degree. So some people have more of it. Some people have less of it. So we all share due to the DNA, due to the DNA and the RRNA, all of us possess some common genetic material but that is to a varying degree. So the degree of which will vary from one person to another. Now let's, learn, now let's have a look at the questions. The first question we have is, which of the following is a defining characteristic of living organisms? Okay, so the first option we have here is growth. 
So as we all know that growth, when it's not specified, is not defining, but a fundamental feature of living organisms. Now, ability to make sound. Okay, so trees don't make sound, but they are living, right? So again, this is not true. Again, the next is reproduction. So as we already know that reproduction is not a defining feature. It's a fundamental feature once again, as we just, you know, learned in some previous slides. And why is that? Because there are so many exceptions to reproduction and they are still living. So reproduction is a fundamental feature and not a defining feature. And the last option we have is a response to external stimuli, which we all also call as consciousness, which is actually a defining feature of living organisms. So here the answer is option D. Now let's have a look at another question. All living organisms are interlinked, are all living organisms are linked to one another because, okay? So we just read about it in some previous slides when we were talking about the important lines from NCRT. I hope you all remember. Let's have a look at the options. They have common genetic material of the same type. Okay, so the common genetic material is the right part. Yes, all of us have that. Yes, of the same type, not really. The next is they share common genetic material, but to varying degrees. Now share common genetic material, that's true. And to varying degrees is also correct. But still, let's look at the third option. What does it say? So all have common cellular organization. Now, of course, we all know that's not true. There are so many living organisms which have different form of cellular organizations. So again, this is not true. This is not true. And because these two are not true, all the above cannot be true. So the answer is P. So the answer is they share common genetic material, but to varying degrees. So what is taxonomy in the first place? So taxonomy is a branch of science that deals with the principles and procedures of identification, nomenclature, and classification okay so we have to understand and learn this definition in this way so it's a branch of science that deals with the principles and procedures of identification nomenclature and classification okay great so now let's think about taxonomy this way a long time ago we got a data from iucn what it is it is basically the international union of conservation of nature and natural resources so it came out that around 1.7 to 1.8 million species. So 1.7 to 1.8 million species are there on the entire earth. So this roughly translates to one point, you know, 70 to 18 lakh species. Now the point is when we are asked to study these species, it is really difficult to understand them without the presence of a proper system. Now, like what if a proper organism is already studied, but documentation was not done. And now you will ask that what is basically the need? Okay, so what is the need to study all of these in the first place? And the answer is, it will help us understand the extinct and endangered, endangered species. Also, it will make us aware about the properties of organisms. Let's say there is an organism which has anti-cancerous enzymes or there is an enzyme that makes evolution easier. Now I'm sure most of the scientists in this world would want to know about these sets of enzymes, right? And all of these questions can be answered by taxonomy, okay? So to escape all the confusion and study the circle of diversity, we need a system and that system is taxonomy. In taxonomy, whenever we find a new species or a new organism, we can easily identify them and give them names and classify them according to the previously classified creatures. Now, in taxonomy, many scientists for many years didn't consider the fact of evolutionary relationships. Okay, so which gives rise to a new system, which is called systematics. Now with the advancement in evolutionary relationship, things became more and more clear. For example, why there was a need for flagellated sperms in certain aquatic animals, or why certain animals had tails and certain did not. Now this made classification, so the evolutionary relationships made classification much, much easier and a lot better. So in the end, we took all the comparative, we took all the comparative parameters in taxonomy. So what are the comparative parameters in taxonomy? The first is morphology. 
Okay, so the first is morphology. The second we have is anatomical. Anatomical. And the third we have is biochemistry. Okay. So we took all of these. So we took all the comparative parameters, which are morphology, anatomical, biochemistry, and added it with the evolutionary relationships, which gave us systematics. So how we can define it? Now phylogenetic analysis plus taxonomy will give us systematics. Okay. So what we did was we took all the comparative parameters in taxonomy. We added phylogenetic analysis into it. And what we got was systematics. Okay, great. So now the question is what happens exactly in systematics? So we have the data from the IUCN. So we have the data, which was the data that around 1.7 to 1.8 million species are there on the entire earth. Okay. So what is IUCN? Once again, let's understand the full form of it. International Union of Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. It's important and all of you must note it down somewhere or learn it because this can be asked in the exams. So what exactly happens now? The order of classification is really important. The first is description. The first we have here is description, which we can also call as characterization. Okay. The first one we have is description or characterization. The I here stands for identification. The N here stands for nomenclature. And the C here stands for classification. Okay. So as we can see that you can easily learn all the order of classification with an easy acronym called DING. So D stands for description and characterization. I stands for identification N for nomenclature and C is for classification. Let's understand it this way. Okay. Because this is the order of classification is something like it's very simple and we actually use it in our everyday life. Okay. Let's understand it properly. So whenever you go somewhere. Okay. So whenever you go somewhere new place, your mind automatically generates a list of how different people looks. Some people have straight hair, some people have curly hair. Okay. Some people are short, some people are tall, some people are attractive, some people aren't. Okay. So now this part is known as description. Okay. So this part is known as description. Then we try to recall and compare them with other people we have already seen. And hence this process is called identification. After all of these things which are done by our brain subconsciously, we go ahead and ask what is their name. Now this is called nomenclature. After we got a name for them, that is nomenclature. Then we classify them and group them as either friends, toppers, maybe nerds, maybe something else. Okay. Acquaintances, whatever it could be. Now this last part is called classification. Now, Let's come to the nomenclature and there are certain rules that are fixed by naming. Now these rules are not given by me. These rules are not given by you. Okay. So these rules are given by different organizations. Okay. So if we're going to name any plant or any botanical creature, you are going, the rules we are going to follow are given by international code of botanical nomenclature, which is also called the ICBN. For any animal, we have the codes from international code of zoological nomenclature, which is ICZN. For naming any bacteria, we have the international code of nomenclature of bacteria, which is the ICNB. And for the naming of any cultivated plants, we have international code of nomenclature for cultivated plants, which is ICNCP. Now, all of you to please understand that a lot of students actually make mistakes here and here. Okay. So they always confuse the botanical nomenclature with the nomenclature of bacteria. So please keep note that the ICBN, okay, so BN here is for the botanical nomenclature and NB here is for the nomenclature of bacteria. Okay. So this is very important and all of you must understand and do not make a mistake here in any exam. Okay. Now let's move on to the binomial nomenclature. So the binomial nomenclature was actually proposed by Casper Boyne in the 1623 in his book called Pinex. Now the thing is that what Casper did was he just gave that the naming should be done in the binomial form and nothing else. The system of binomial nomenclature, which is the most widely used 
form of nomenclature was actually developed by Carlos Linnaeus, who is also the father of taxonomy. Okay, so he is the father of taxonomy. Now, the system was developed by Carlos Linnaeus. Now, Carlos Linnaeus, in his publication Philosophica Botanica in 1751, gave all the rules for binomial nomenclature. So if there is a question in exams which says that in which book actually did Carlos gives all his rule for the binomial nomenclature and the answer to it is, it is Philosophica Botanica in what year in the year 1751. So this is really important. In 1753, he started naming plants in his publication Species Planetarum. In 1758, he started naming animals in his publication called the Systema Naturae. Okay, and his first ever publication, the first ever publication of Linnaeus was Hortus Aplanticus. Okay, now all of you to please understand that all of this that we are studying in this particular side is actually apart from what is given in the NCRT. So the first thing we need to do is to understand everything that is given in the NCRT and then come on to it. Okay, now let's study some of the rules of binomial nomenclature. Okay. So here we are going to take the example of mango. As you can see, we have the picture of mango here. So the scientific name for mango is Mangifera, Mangifera indica. Okay. Now the first rule we have is that the name should be in Latin or the name should be Latinized. Name should be Latin or Latinized. Now you all must be thinking why Latin, okay? So why Latin must be a question for all of you. Now the answer to this is that because it is a dead language, in today's date, no one, no one reads or speaks in this language. Therefore, there will be no conflict between people that if the name should be in Hindi, English or their own native language. Also, new words are being added in the language. As you must have seen, you know, in English especially, you must have seen that new words are added every year in the dictionary and everywhere else. And there are new acronyms, there are new slangs people are using every day. This creates a problem. But in Latin language, this issue is basically eliminated because Latin is, because Latin is a static language. Okay. So basically Latin is a static language. Now, the second rule we have here is that the name should be of two words. Okay. So the first word is genus and the second name and the second part of it is specific epithet. Okay. Now genus tells us the classification. Okay. So genus tells us the classification. Genus tells us the classification. Well, the specific epithet tells us from where it belongs or some special feature about the living being. Like where here we have indica, indica, which is the specific epithet of Mengifera indica. Okay, so this is the specific epithet part. Now here indica means India. What does this mean? This means that indica belongs to India. This means we're talking about a fruit which belongs to India. So the third rule we have here is that whenever written by hand, so whenever we are writing these scientific names by hand, they need to be separately underlined. Okay, so they need to be separately underlined. And whenever they are printed, they should be in italics. So whenever they're handwritten, they should be separately underlined as you can see up here. And whenever they are printed, they should be in italics. Okay. And the fourth rule is that first alphabet of genus, the first alphabet of genus is should be in uppercase. And the first alphabet of specific epithet should be in lowercase. As you can see in our example, Mengifera indica, here M is in capital, which is the first alphabet of genus. While indica, the first letter of indica, which is I, is in lowercase. So this is perfectly written. Now, the fifth part we have here is, the fifth rule we have is genus plus specific epithet plus scientific name. Okay. So what does this mean? That whenever we are writing scientific names, other than the genus and specific epithet, one more thing must be written. And what is it? It is the name of the scientist who discovered it. So it is always written in short form followed by a dot. For example, Mangifera indica, it was given by Lin, Carlos Linnaeus. So we will write Lin and we will also follow it by a dot. 
Okay, so we have genus plus specific epithet plus scientific scientist name. Now all of us must understand that now genus and specific epithet, the genus and the specific epithet, these should be you know always underlined. Why? Because they are in the Latin language. But the scientist name is in Roman language, and that is why it will not be underlined. The words that are underlined shows that they are in the Latin origin. Now the question arises, let's say I am sitting somewhere in Bihar. Okay, so I am in Bihar and you are in South America. Okay, so I am in Bihar and you are in South America. And now we both are sitting and we both gave a name to a same tree. Okay, following all the rules. So we all follow, we both followed all the rules given here and we both gave a name to the same tree. Now whose name will be given priority? So the answer to this question is that the, the, that this person who gave the name first in the scientific journal. So the person who gave the name first in scientific journal will be given priority. So if I gave the name in the scientific journal first, I will be given priority. And if you give the name in the scientific journal, journal first, you will be given priority. Okay. So this means all the scientific naming follows the law of priority. Great. Now, let's see this once again. Let's go on to this slide once again. Now, sometimes it is important to know that sometimes that the genus and the specific epithet are exactly the same. So, you know, for example, ratus, ratus. Okay. And then there is naja, naja. As you can see here in ratus, ratus and in naja, naja, you can see very clearly that both of these have the same specific genus and the and, you know specific epithet. So here ratus is a genus and ratus is a specific epithet. Here naja is the genus and naja is a specific epithet. Now these are also known as totonyms. Okay, so these are known as totonyms. Now it is very important to understand that totonyms are allowed in zoological nomenclature, but totonyms are not allowed in botanical nomenclature. Okay. Let's understand this once again that the totonyms are allowed in zoological nomenclature, but they are not allowed in the botanical nomenclature. Okay, great. Now let's move on to the question. So the botan the question we have here is the botanical name is a two word name with genus and species. So species is what basically are specific epithet okay so the botanical name is a two word name with genus and species now the correct representation of mango in a biological term is okay first of all as you can clearly see here that all of these names are printed okay and whenever any word is any scientific name is printed we do not underline it we only underline it when we are actually handwriting it. Okay. So here all the underlined ones are wrong. And even so, whenever we are handwriting it, we will always underline them differently. Okay. Separately. So if I was actually writing the name of mango, which is the Mangifera, the Mangifera Indica. So here, because I'm handwriting it in front of all of you, here we have to separately underline it, not in the same way. So this would be wrong. This would be right. Okay. So the first two options are eliminated. Now let's look at option number D. Here, the first alphabet of genus, which is the Mangifera, here M is not capital. Therefore, this is wrong as well. Now only the option C is correct because it is printed and it is in italics. The first alphabet is capital of genus and the first alphabet of specific epithet, which is I is in small. So this follows all the rules and the correct answer is option C. Great. So we have already studied what is taxonomy and nomenclature. And now is the time to study taxonomic hierarchies and taxonomical aids. Now taxonomical hierarchy is a very, very important topic of this chapter and questions have been asked from this topic in NEET and AIMS. So what is taxonomic hierarchy? So what happened was that for our convenience, we made a classification. So we humans thought that it would be easy for us to classify organisms if we have a certain stage. 
For instance, in this proper taxonomical hierarchy, species is the most fundamental unit or the basic unit which actually exists in this world. So species is our fundamental unit. It's our fundamental unit that exists in this world. And all the other categories are just made by grouping these species. So we just have to define species and then we will automatically will be able to define all the other categories. Now the series of these labels, labels are known as taxonomic categories or taxonomic hierarchies. The taxonomic hierarchy is divided into seven obligate ranks or groups that you can already see which is kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus and species. And each of these categories individually are called taxon. So each of these categories individually are known as taxon. Now there is a very simple mnemonics to learn these categories in this particular order and it is very important to learn these categories in this particular order. So what is the mnemonics? It goes like keep pots clean otherwise family gets sick so the mnemonic reads keep pots clean otherwise family gets sick so here keep is for kingdom pots is for phylum clean is for class otherwise is for order family is for family gets is for genus and sick is for species now in this particular hierarchy Kingdom is the largest, so our kingdom is our largest and species is our smallest unit. Okay, so species is our smallest unit. And there is also another category on the top of, on the, top of the kingdom which is called domain. But it has not been officially added in this particular hierarchy. So we are not going to study about it. But it is important to understand that there is another category above kingdom which is domain. Now these seven categories are the main ones. What are these seven categories? Let's revise it again. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Keep pots clean otherwise family gets sick. But there are some sub hierarchies as well. For example, under species, there is subspecies. So there is subspecies and variety under species. And there is also one thing called suborders, which is obviously under orders. So there is suborders. And there is a very important category that we all must know and that can also be asked in exams. So this is a subcategory which is called tribe. Now tribe lies between family and genus. So tribe is a very very important category and all of us must remember this. And we can compare this tribe to the human tribe that we all are already very familiar with. So in all there are around 21 to 22 categories that lie between these are 7 main categories. Now let's talk about the general characteristics. So if we talk about the general characteristics, so we are talking about the general characteristics. So we talk about the general characteristics. They are present the most in kingdom and they are present the least in species. General characteristics are the maximum in kingdom and least or minimum in species. But if we talk about specific characteristics, so if we, if we talk about specific characteristics, so if we talk about specific characteristics, now they are maximum in, so they are maximum in species while they are minimum in kingdom. And this is very important because you can be asked the MCQ question on this basis that where do we find the maximum general character 6 or where do we find the minimum general character 6. So where we find the maximum general character 6 in kingdom and where do we find the minimum general character 6 in species. 
But if the question is where do we find the maximum specific characteristics, then the answer will be species. And if the question is where do we find the minimum specific characteristics, then the answer will be kingdom. And you will attempt a question on this basis. So please understand this and remember this, how we are going about maximum to minimum when we talk about general and specific characteristics. So you must understand that classification basis changes at every level. Okay, so classification basis changes at every level. Let's understand this using an example. So for example, you have an Almira. Okay, so let's understand this concept by comparing it to your Almira. Now you classify your Almira by deciding that you will keep all your clothes in it, right? Now then you classify them on the basis of party clothes and then jeans and shirts, t-shirts or tops and then your night suits, right? Now all of this is called classification. And here is one thing very important to note. Note that we also use the term division. We also use the term division for phylum. Now we use division for plants while we use phylum for animals. There similarly, there are the subspecies that we talked about under species. Subspecies is used for animals while variety is used for plants. Now let's define species. Now let's define species. Now what is actually species? Okay. Now there were like a lot of definition of species given by many, many scientists. At first, we classified morphologically similar organisms as species. So the first cat type which was that we classified was morphologically. Yes. So at first we defined species on the morphologically similar organisms. They were all called as one species. Now this was known as the morphological species concept. But then we came to know that this is actually not true. Then someone said that organisms who live at the same place. Second was people who were living at the same place are now called as species. But that's not true because as we already know that humans are widespread. So our second one was also called the topographic basis. Second one was topographic basis and that was rejected as well. Now, after this, we had the another one. Okay, so this one was given by Ernest Mayer. And this is the most widely accepted definition of species. And what does it say? It says species as a group of actually or potentially interbreeding populations that are reproductively isolated from other such groups. Now, what is species? Species is a group of actually or potentially interbreeding populations. The population must be able to interbreed and that are reproductively isolated from other such groups. So this means they can only interbreed within their own species and they can't interbreed outside their species. And when we talk about interbreeding, this also means that they must have a fertile offspring. So after interbreeding, a fertile offspring is also necessary. So if the offspring is infertile, then we understand that they are not from the same species. One of the biggest examples for this is that, that we have a cross of horses and donkeys. So with this cross, we are, what we actually get is mules. But this does not mean that horses and donkeys are the same species. Why? Because mules are infertile. In nature, mules are infertile. Okay, great. Now, let's talk about this question. Okay, so this question that we have with us, which of the following taxonomical ranks contain organisms least similar to one another? So the question is, which of the following taxonomical ranks contain organisms least similar? So least is an important word, similar to one another. Okay, so we have to go for the least similar one. Let's you know, revise the order of all the classes that we wrote, which is keep pots clean, otherwise family gets sick, which is kingdom phylum class order family genus and species. Okay, great. 
Now we have to find uh, taxonomical ranks that contain least similar to one another. So we already learned that the most general characteristics are in kingdom, but the least general characteristics are in species. But what we are talking about here is that least similar to one another. So the, what we talk about that species has the maximum specific characteristics. So here species are the most similar to one another. And as we go up this ladder, this decreases the similarity between organisms decreases and it is the least in kingdom and maximum in species. So according to this, we have four options, class, genus, family and species. So the taxonomical rank which lies higher in the hierarchy will have the least similar characteristics to one another. So here we have class. So class is here. Then we have genus, then we have family and then we have species. So as we can already see that class lies at the highest from these options. So the correct answer to this question is class. So which of the following taxonomical ranks contain organisms least similar to one another? The answer is option A class. Now let's look at what is genus. Great. So now genus is divided between two types, monotypic and polytypic. Okay. Now what is monotypic and polytypic? So like monotypic genus is that which contains only, which includes only one species. Okay. So example for that would be homo sapiens. Who are homo sapiens? Homo sapiens are us humans. Okay, great. So we are an example of monotyp monotypic genus because Homo sapiens have a monotypic genus which is called Homo. While polytypic genus is that which includes more than one species. So this has more than one living species. More than one living species. Okay. So an example for that could be the genus Panthera. So with Panthera, we have a polytypic including lion, tiger, leopard, and etc. So all the big cats, they are come, they come in the category of Panthera, like lion, tiger, the lion, tiger, and leopard. Great. Now let's look at this particular table that we have with us. So here we have defined the taxons, which is kingdom, division, class, order, family, genus, and species. And we have decided the suffix, suffix that will go with them. With kingdom, there is no definite suffix. With division, we have phyta for plants and sperme for animals. With class, we have ne for, for plants and opsida for animals. With order, we have elise. With family, we have ace. So it's pronounced as ace. With genus, we have no definite suffix. And with species, we have no definite suffix. You can find this table in the NCRT also. And it is very important to learn this because questions can be asked on what suffix we use for the, a particular taxon. So you must remember all of these suffixes. Suffix now let's go, go with it. Again, we have this another table with it. Organisms with their taxonomic categories. Organisms with their taxonomic categories. Once again, this is a table directly picked up from the NCRT that all of you must read, understand and remember by heart. For example, we have here the common name for man. It's biological name Homo sapiens. The genus is Homo. As we say with we have mango, which is Mangifera indica and the genus is Mangifera. Like this, we have all of these four that we must remember and learn by heart because questions are asked from these, this particular table a lot in the exams. So take a screenshot of this or pause here, but learn this by heart. Great. Now let's move to question number two. Now, which of the following suffixes, suffixes used for units of classification plants indicates a taxonomic category of family. So here we have to find the suffix for units of classification in plants indicates a taxonomic category of family. So if you remember the table that we just read earlier, you could easily understand and find the answer to this. Let's go back to the table once. So here we can see in the table with the family, the suffix that we have to use is a CE. The fa with family, our suffix is a CE. So with this, our answer here would be option C, a C E. Great. Now let's talk about taxonomical aids. Now taxonomical aids, as the name suggests, helps us in the classification system. So taxonomical aids actually helps us in the classification system. 
Now let us study all of these taxonomical aids and the first one that we are going to talk about is the herbarium. Herbarium, let's break it down. Herbarium basically is an aid for plants. It is very easy to interpret it as we have herb in the first you know, prefix of the entire word. So we have herbarium that starts with the word herb. So it's very important to understand that this place is only and only for plants. So we have dried plants here that are preserved. It is basically a quick referral system for morphology majorly and it helps in the scientific study. Now the question is how to make a perfect herbarium sheet. There is a proper procedure that one must follow in which a specimen can be represented. The first step is to make a herbarium sheet is collection. The number one point that you must keep in mind while collecting the specimen is that plant should not be diseased. This is because if you collect a plant with disease, then not only the current specimen will be corrupted, but the other specimens in the herbarium will get diseased and maybe a fungus infection spreads. So the plant specimen must not be a diseased one. So in our first step of collection, we need to understand that the plant is not a diseased one. Now the second point is, if I collect a specimen with black spots or yellow curling of the leaf, then the other person must feel that this is the real morphology of that plant. And if I collect that specimen and I put it in the herbarium and it had black spots on it, now some other person in some other country tries to identify that same plant, he or she will think that these black spots are actually the original morphological feature of that plant. But you and I both know that it's not true. It, and the whole black spots were because of a disease of that plant. So we have to collect a specimen very, very carefully. The next point that needs to be taken care of while collecting a specimen is that you must collect the parts of the plant that has the most plant parts. Now it is very easy when you have a small plant or a sapling. Like you take up the whole plant and put it on the sheet. But when it is a large tree, what should we do then? In that case, you will take that twig of the plant in which maximum parts of the plant are seen. For example, a twig. So basically we take a twig that has leaves, stem, seeds and flowers. So basically a twig which, which has the maximum parts of the plant. Now sometimes there are plants whose flowers or seeds wilt very quickly. In that case, we can put a, we can, you know, use a sachet and we can put the flowers and the seeds in the sachet and then stitch it on the herbarium seed. Also, you must take care while bringing that twig to the lab because it shouldn't be damaged at the time of preservation. All these are the pointers that one must keep in mind while collecting a specimen. Now, after the collection, when the specimen has reached the lab, now the next step is to dry it. So our next step is to dry the specimen. And how do we do that? We don't go out in the sun and sun dry it. You just have to wrap it in the newspaper in a way that it does not get folded and then keep it under some pressure. Keep it under your mattress or under some heavy object so that the moisture is gone in the dried plant specimen. Now the moisture that the newspaper is, is absorbing can get infected and the specimen can get fungus. So it is really very important to change the newspapers regularly. And we must keep in mind that we have to change the newspapers regularly. In the starting we would have to change the newspapers much more often than in the later stages. And if the fungus gets caught in that specimen, the specimen color will change and it will get destroyed. That is why it is very important to keep changing the newspapers regularly. Now the third and the most important point is poisoning. When the plant specimen is dried, we spray 0.1%, we spray 0.1% solution of HgCl2. The mercuric chloride will act as a disinfectant and will kill all the microbes present on it. The next step is mounting. This means that you keep the specimen on the herbarium sheet. Then the next step is to stitch that specimen. 
So our next step is to stitch the specimen with the herbarium sheet. Now it is not done with the glue because it will infect or it will poison the plant. So while stitching, it is not done with the glue. Okay, so when we are putting it, we are when we are mounting it on the paper at the end of the day, we have to make sure that we do not use glue. We have to stitch it. And how do we do this? We do it that we stitch with the thread at certain parts, at certain points, so that the plants get stitched to a herbarium sheet and does not fall off. The next step is to label that herbarium sheet. Now the herbarium sheet is standard all over the world and the size is 41 into 29 centimeter square. Now this is the size of the herbarium sheet that is accepted all over the world. And when we write a label, we put it on the right bottom corner of the herbarium sheet. Okay. And there is also perfect size for that label and we must follow it. And the size is 7 into 12 centimeter square. Now the question is, when we put a label, what do we have to actually write on that label? So there are some, so, some specific things that are to be written on the label. And they are, first, it is the name of the collector. Second is the place of collection. Third is date of collection. Fourth is the botanical name of that plant. Fifth is the English name of the plant. And the sixth is the vernacular name of the plant. This means the common name of that plant. Now the vernacular name depends upon the area where you have collected the specimen. Now what is the common name, that common name of that particular plant in that area where the plant has been collected. So we need to write that name too. And the seventh is that we need to write the family of that plant. Now there are more points like height of the plant and the economic importance of the plant that you can also write on the label. But these are not the major things. So you can skip them and there is no hard and fast rule to write them every time when you are writing the label. But the seven points we discussed earlier, which is the name of the collector, place of collection, date of collection, botanical name, English name, vernacular name and family of the plant. All these sevens are really important and we have to write them every time we are preparing the label. Now the last step after labeling is deposition. So we are now going to deposit that herbarium means that this herbarium sheet that you have made is to be placed on a place where it can be found easily. So the herbarium is a storehouse of collected, dried, pressed and preserved plant specimen. So there are herbariums that are present at the national level. For example, the Royal Botanical Garden at Kew in England and the Central National Herbarium at Calcutta. As you can see, there is a survey of the plant herbarium. So this is what a normal herbarium looks like. Now let's look at the next taxonomical aid that we have with us, that is the museums. Now what are museums and what do they do? It is for the storing, preservation and exhibition of both plants and animals. So in museum we find both plants and animals. And why we are doing this? This is used for studying and reference. So as you can see, we have three pictures here. In the first, it is called the formalin preserved. So as you can see, there are organisms present in it and the acid that we are being used is called is the formalin acid. And this is how they are being preserved so that their body does not decompose and it stays intact for anyone to observe at a later stage. This is formalin preserved. Another type of preservation that we have is stuffed preservation. As you can see in this particular image that you can see that there are animals, you know, which is with like perfect statues of these animals. So what do we do in stuffed preservation? So we take the animal, we take out all the internal organs out of them. Just keep the main structure, the bones and the skin. We use a you know preservative coating inside of the animal so that the skin does not decompose from the inside. And we use a preservative on the outside skin also so that the skin doesn't get decomposed from the outside. And then we put cotton inside of it. So we stuff it with cotton, hence the name stuffed preservation. The third one we have is pinned. So in pinned what we do is that in certain insects or you know in certain insects what we do like for a butterfly or a beetle as you can see. What do we do is that we take that beetle, the dead beetle and what we do? We put them, we use their wings and we put them, uh, you know, we switch them with thumb pins or something else on a particular sheet for everyone to see. We do this with butterflies and other type of insects like beetles and butterflies. Great. As you can see. Now our next is the botanical gardens. 
This is the third type of our taxonomical aid. Now here it's written the term X C2 conservation. What do we mean by this? In a botanical garden, what we do is that we take out species from their natural habitat, take them out and then we conserve them at a different place. That is what a botanical garden is all about. So X C2 stands for X situated. So earlier the plant was situated at a different place and now it is at a different place for the preservation and the conservation of that particular plant. So of the examples of botanical gardens are National Botanical Garden Lucknow, Indian Botanical Garden Havra, Royal Botanical Garden England. Great. As you can see there are some pictures of students studying and understanding about the botanical gardens in Lucknow. Then there is an Indian Botanical Garden in Havra. The next one we have there is zoological parks. So zoological parks are of course for the animals. Again, and zoological parks are also the X C2. So, so the animals were present in a different habitat, and we take them out from that habitat and we and we conserve them in different zoological parks. So, living wild animals are kept in protected environment. How is the environment in zoological parks protected? So here, no one is going to hunt them or harm them in any sense. So that is why we call it a protected environment. Again, it's a X C2 conservation of animals because we are taking animals from one habitat where they are situated to a different one. And the third point is ideal means to study and learn different food habits and behavior of animals. So zoological parks are an ideal place to study for different food habits and behavior of animals. Great. So this is a national zoological park. So as you can see, there is a tiger here who in, the, in its you know, protected environment. Let's look at this question. So one of the most important functions of botanical garden is that first they provide a beautiful area for recreation. Second, one can observe tropical plants there. Third, they allow XC2 conservation of germplasm. And fourth, they provide the natural habitat for wildlife. Let's look at it. First, they provide a beautiful area for recreation. Of course, all the botanical gardens are made in a very beautiful way. They are very aesthetic to look at. They are very aesthetic to be at. They are beautiful, but they are not made for the purpose of recreation. So when you talk about the most important function of a botanical garden, it won't be recreation. So answer A, the option A is wrong. The second is one can observe tropical plants there. So yes, one can observe tropical plants there, but there are a lot more plants in a botanical garden than just a tropical plant. So again, this is not the most important function of a botanical garden. Now look at option C. They allow XC2 conservation of germplasm. Of course, as we read, this is an XC2 conservation is there in a botanical garden. And for germplasm, what we means is different variety and or at the times all variety of plants and of all plants. So yes, they allow X C2 conservation of germplasm. This is correct and this is the most important function of a botanical garden. It is to X C2 conservation of germplasm. So option C is correct. But for reference, also look at option D. Here option D it states they provide a natural habitat for wildlife. And we all know botanical gardens are specifically for plants. Hence, wildlife is wrong. So option D is also wrong. So the correct answer is option C. Now let's understand what are taxonomical keys. So taxonomical keys are basically an analytical tool. And what do they do? They helps in identification of plants and animals based on similarities and dissimilarities. So what basically happens is that we see a particular creature that we do not know much about. So we first of all, we give a lead to it. Okay, so we provide a couplet to each of it first of all, which is a pair of contrasting state characters. So maybe the plant has roots, fibrous roots or tab roots or the animal has fur or no fur. So these are a pair of contrasting characters which are called couplet. And with that we get leads of each statement to follow through and then separate keys are used for different taxonomic categories. Let's understand it with an example. So basically suppose you found a vertebrate class and you saw that that vertebrate class had does not have any fur. So we go for this. Now, does it have feathers or not? Assuming it has no feathers. So we go for this. Then 
if we talk about does it does external fertilization or internal fertilization so if it does internal fertilization it will be a reptile but if it does external fertilization then again we have two point two parts does it have gills in adult or no gills in adult if it has gills in adult it will be a fish if it has no gills in adult it will be an amphibian see we just knew about some part of it and we started giving couplets to each one of them and after understanding the lead out of that couplet we went on to our classification at the end stage we are able to find out that either if it's a fish or an amphibian great so this is all about taxonomical keys now let's talk about question number 4 which one of the following is not a correct statement the first statement is herbarium houses dried pressed and preserved plant specimen if you know about herbarium we know that this is correct next is botanical gardens have collection of living plants for reference that's true too we a botanical garden does have a living plants for references and has a whole collection of it because it conserves the living plants see a museum has collection of photographs of plants and animals so photographs is the key word here let's come back to it the last is key is a taxonomic aid for identification of specimens as we just read taxonomical key yes that's true and we have to find the statement which is not a correct statement so if we talk about this the most inappropriate or not true statement out of the all four will be a museum has a collection of photographs of plants and animals because a museum has a lot more than just the photographs it has stuff as we talked about you know different preservatives and different collections no not just the photographs photographs are really present in museums so that is the thing so option c will be wrong here so it will be the most untrue statement out of this four great with this we have come to the end of taxonomic hierarchies and taxonomical aids and i hope all of you understood all the concepts properly